morning. Welcome to Standish Congregational Church on the calm after the storm, I guess you'd call it. Um, I hope all of you navigated the weather successfully. Looks like you did. And it's lovely to have such a beautiful sunny day. We're going to have a lot of nice melting today, I think. Uh, once again, welcome. Whether you're here in person, thank you for being here or joining us online either now or later on Zoom. Uh, we are an open and affirming church. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you're welcome here. So uh, once again, welcome. And I want to give a big thank you for those who cleared out the walkways this morning. Um, I understand that as Bill Tracy was pulling up with his trusty snowblower, uh, Sid Pollard was sprinkling the last bits of sand on the walkways that she had cleared. So big, big thanks to uh, Sid and to Bill and to all those who, who help when the, when the weather comes. Please join Diane Black in the call to worship. Come into the wilderness. Step into the unknown possibility that is here in this place with all of our questions. The sun might be shining, but it still feels bleak. We step into the wilderness because we have questions, and it is here that it feels safe to ask what we long to know. We come together to find a deeper understanding of God's love. Seekers of truth, wilderness wanderers, askers of questions, let us worship God. Please join in singing the hymn of approach. Day is done, number 268. Once again, welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, please join us for fellowship and coffee and goodies in the fellowship hall after the service. Um, I do want to mention uh, or remind everyone that we have a Lenten book discussion series beginning this week. Um, we'll be meeting just after the service, after the coffee hour uh, festivities are over, um, discussing the, the last week by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. So um, if you're interested, it's not too late. Um, but feel free to join us, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Um, another reminder that uh, we are we have begun to pass the plate during the offertory, so be prepared for that, and uh, also followed by the doxology um, after the um, offering is collected, which is number 46 in your hymnal. Um, I'll call your attention to the announcement sheet. There's several uh, 
items to pay attention to on here. Uh, is there anything that anyone wants to call out specifically? Sue. Um, can I Just a moment. We'll wait for the microphone, if you don't mind. Okay, so uh, the mission board um, is going to be doing one great hour of sharing. And I did a little research. Um, it started in 1946, so it's 69 years old or, or that. Um, the envelopes will be in your bulletin next week, um, and the collection will be um, on March 19th. Uh, it is clearly a world kind of one great hour of sharing. Um, so we ask you to be intentional about thinking about what you'd like to give. Thank you, Sue. And obviously those envelopes did make it into the bulletin this week. So a uh, little preview. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> we're doubly covered. <laughs> Anything else anyone would like to announce this morning? All right. Well, seeing none. Uh, let us continue more intentionally in worship. Please join me in the opening prayer. God of night and of day, we dare to venture out into the unknown, to the edge of the wilderness where you will guide us. We come to be led and encouraged. We come to find answers to questions we didn't even know we had. We come to find you steadfast and true. Amen.
Hi, Sawyer. Hi, Zad. Hi, Amelia. Hi, Ari. Hi, Miss Betsy. <laughs> so today, I want you to think about if it was possible, if you could arrange it, is there somebody that you would like to meet? And while you ponder this, I thought about it. I thought uh, somebody you would like to meet and somebody you have questions for. So I would like to meet Jane Goodall. She's an anthropologist that worked for most of her life studying uh, chimpanzees. She was born in England, but she also spent most of her life in Africa because that's where the chimpanzees are. So I would like to ask her, what is it like to live out in the wild? Were you scared of the insects that might be crawling around? Were you in a tent? Um, how did you keep your notes safe from getting wet if it rained? Um, I think I could answer a lot of those questions by reading her book. She's written about 20. Um, but anyway, that, that's who I would like to meet, and those are some of the questions I would ask. Have you been able to think of something? Or somebody? I would like to meet Jesus. I would like to meet God. You would like to meet God. Okay, how about a person on the... I would like to meet any veterinarian, because I want to be one when I grow up. How much do they get paid? <laughs> <laughs> Did you come up with anybody? Anything? All right. Well, today you're going to hear about a guy named Nicodemus, and he, Jesus, and he wanted to ask questions about what do you mean when you talk about new life? And do you suppose Jesus had an answer? He did, he did. He explained all about it. Um, so um, at, keep, keep that thought, Nicodemus. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for new life. Thank you, God, for loving everybody. Amen. C.S. Lewis is who I'd want to meet. <laughs> Although you didn't say dead or alive, so. The familiar story of Nicodemus and his nighttime encounter with Jesus gets new life when read in a modern paraphrased Bible version. So please listen as Diane reads John chapter 3, or most of it anyway, from the Message Bible. Reading from John chapter 3, in the message. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me, unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, the kingdom of God. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit and becomes a living spirit. Don't be so surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows 
this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above by the wind of God, the spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics. Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I've seen with my own eyes. There's nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you of things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, the one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Here ends the reading. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have a number of friends who are gifted designers for the stage. Theater, of course, is primarily a visual art. And my designer friends go to great lengths to create visual impressions. Gorgeous set pieces that dazzle with color or provide painstaking detail to recreate reality or abstract shapes that stir emotion or suggest a state of mind. Lighting designs that focus attention or highlight dramatic elements. All of these designs are designed to make sure the audience sees and experiences the production exactly the way the designers and the director want them to, to see what they want you to see. On the converse side, they go to just as great trouble to make sure you don't see what they don't want you to see. The theater darkens, the curtain opens to reveal the opening scene, and only the opening scene. The proscenium, we kind of have a proscenium here, frames the scene. Masking curtains block actors waiting in the wings to make their entrances out of the audience's view. Light and sound technicians are hidden in out of sight booths over the crowd's heads. Lights are focused so as to bring the attention toward the action and away from set changes happening in darkened corners. You're seeing what the director wants you to see and what they don't want you to see remains hidden. In the third chapter of John's Gospel, we meet Nicodemus, a prominent, devout Jew, a Pharisee, likely a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin, you may recall, were a tribunal of judges that met in Jerusalem. They were sort of allowed to coexist with the Roman authorities as long as they kept their judgments to matters of Jewish religion and customs. As a member of this group, Nicodemus would have been a well-respected man of some influence. And evidence later in John's Gospel suggests that he was a man of wealth as well. So Nicodemus would have had quite a reputation to uphold when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. 
By this time, Jesus has quite a reputation himself, with chatter attributing to him miraculous powers of healing, and many presenting him as a, a rebel intent on overthrowing the power of Rome over the province of Ju Judea. In coming by night, Nicodemus is revealing his concern for his reputation. Whether Jesus' intentions are spiritual or political, either way, being seen with him in a context other than confrontational might tarnish his image in the eyes of Jewish and Roman leaders alike. Nicodemus comes to Jesus under cover of night to ask some interesting questions. The first is not so much a question as a rhetorical questioning statement. You've got to be from God, right? No one could do the things we've seen if they weren't from God. Jesus' reply about new birth prompts Nicodemus' second question. How can one be born a second time? What does that mean? And the third question reveals the paradigm shift required by all who encounter Jesus and wish to follow in his way. The learned teacher of Israel asks, how can these things be? Well, before I talk about the conversation Nicodemus had with Jesus in the shadows of Jerusalem, I want to explore a little bit more about who Nicodemus is or was with an assist from blogger Kevin Keating, who writes about the character of Nicodemus as he's presented in the online streaming series, The Chosen, which follows Jesus as he gathers his disciples and launches his ministry in Galilee. I believe John, the gospel writer, chose to include this story because Nicodemus represents John's readers in a number of ways. And we might recognize ourselves in this sincere, devout man and his questioning nature. The story of Nicodemus's nighttime visit stresses the significance of personal encounters with Jesus. Jesus certainly didn't shy away from crowds, but he favored the one-on-one -on -one relationship. And that's what Jesus calls us to today. We worship together, we enjoy the fellowship of believers, but each of us nurtures their own relationship with God and with Jesus. Coming by night, Nicodemus could be described as a fearful follower. For him, as for us today, there are social, political, and in some parts of the world, physical consequences of faith displays. Perhaps, like us, he hides, obscures motives, hedges his bets. He initially seeks to remain unseen, hidden by his own theatrical curtains, ducking into shadows, avoiding the spotlight. Later, as the Pharisees become more aggressive in their opposition to Jesus' ministry, Nicodemus peeks from behind this curtain. In chapter 7 of John's Gospel, as the Sanhedrin are conspiring to bring Jesus in on charges of blasphemy and rebellion, Nicodemus asks his fellow Pharisees to give Jesus the benefit of the doubt. Can we judge him without hearing what he has to say? Eventually, he seems to overcome his fear of a sullied reputation, but at this point, Jesus has been crucified and buried. Nicodemus emerges from the shadows with a daringly public offering of burial spices, about 75 pounds worth, hard to secretly purchase or transport. This public display seems to indicate that Nicodemus may at some point have made a decision to become a disciple of Jesus. John doesn't explicitly say. But although a fearful follower, Nicodemus is definitely a genuine seeker. We're not given his age, but being a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, he must have been extensively educated for a man of his time. John calls him a prominent ruler of the Jews. So he would have been pretty confident of his knowledge, particularly of the Hebrew scriptures. But his conversation with Jesus reveals his openness to questioning his own worldview, not unlike a modern seeker of today. However, perhaps unlike his pharisaical colleagues, Nicodemus asks questions designed not to trick or entrap Jesus, but with genuine respect for a fellow rabbi, 
honest questions intended to enlighten and enrich, not attack and tear down. Nicodemus seems to show genuine interest in the radical new kingdom of God that Jesus is inviting him to explore. So how does Jesus respond to Nicodemus's genuine, honest questions? To the first rhetorical question, Jesus is asked for confirmation of the source of his power and wisdom. Jesus's response is familiar to us, but perhaps no less puzzling to us than it was to Nicodemus. Unless one is born again or born from above or born of the spirit, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Many people, perhaps us included, think they know what born again means. And I'm not gonna go off on that tangent here, except to say this, you can only tell the root by the fruit. In other words, born anew is not a badge you get to wear, a pass into some secret club. It should be humbling, not a source of pride. You will know members of the kingdom of God, not by their accolades, but by the quality of their character. To quote a favorite song of mine by Christian hard rock pioneer Glenn Kaiser of Resurrection Band, you'll know them by their love and by their fruit, not by pearly teeth, Mercedes, or fine suits, not by where they go or what they can afford, not by Jesus as their savior, but as their Lord. So that hits at Jesus' answer to the second question. How can one be born a second time? Jesus says, You know the wind is present, not because you can see it, but because you can see its effects. You can see a tree swaying in the breeze, but you can't see the breeze. You may not know someone is a follower of Jesus just by looking at them, but if you see the hungry fed, the poor lifted up, the oppressed given voice, the lonely approached in glad fellowship, you know the Lord is in it. As to the third question, how can these things be? We're still asking that one. And the answer is the same today as it was at that late night encounter. With God, all things are possible. How can these things be? Because the second person of the triune God came to dwell among us in human flesh. And wherever he went, the miraculous became reality. The lame healed, the blind given sight, the dead raised to new life, the cynical and questioning brought to faith. Jesus answered Nicodemus's questions, not judgmentally, but in ways that encouraged deeper consideration, culminating in that famous statement that we may not have realized occurs in this context as part of Jesus's answers to Nicodemus's question. We may have imagined that John 3.16 was delivered to a crowd of onlookers as part of one of Jesus' famous sermons. But here, in this quiet nighttime encounter, that statement is revealed to be an invitation. Yes, to Nicodemus, but through John's writing, ultimately to us all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. And that's the invitation God has for us today, that we might believe in his son, in what he did on this earth, in how he calls us to live our own lives in faith, and the one-on-one relationship he calls us to. Then we can begin to see the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying to us, as he did to Simon Peter, who do you say that I am? That is the defining question for Nicodemus, for me, and for you. Amen. We, uh, we are in the dark season of Lent, but we anticipate the coming of the morning. So let us join together in singing our hymn of praise, Morning Has Broken, number 258.
be seated. And now let us bring before God and each other the joys and concerns of our hearts. Does anyone have a joy or a concern to share this morning? Good morning. My first joy is I know we've all been praying for superhero Alex and on Facebook um, a week or so ago there was a picture of him entering his first day of grade 11 at his high school. So he has come through his treatment and now he's in public school going to school and he looks thrilled beyond belief, and so is everybody else. So that's a blessing. My second joy is on Friday evening, I got the pleasure of witnessing the one-act competitive play that Bonnie Eagle High School is performing. My granddaughter, Abigail, had a part, a very nice part, and she was typecast. It was quite something to watch her flouncing around the stage as a very angry attorney. <laughs> and she pulled it off with great aplomb. So I was thrilled beyond words. And as I was sitting there looking around, and I was so grateful for all the people that put so much time and energy working with those kids. They were so good. And the competition is next Saturday, and she is over the moon. Of course, she broke her retainer in the whole thing, so now we have an, an emergency to attend to this week. But it was such a pleasure to see her bloom. She's certainly in her element, Dave. And as I was listening to you talk about theater, I just couldn't help but giggle. <laughs> thank you. A kindred spirit, thank you. Um, this week I had a note from Jolene Weber's daughter, Jill, and um, she was saying her mother's doing very well, settling in, um, enjoying exercise class, playing bridge, cribbage, and bingo. And according to Jill, she'd always hated bingo. But so, <laughs> and I also have her phone number, cell phone, if anybody wants it. But on another note, you know we've been gathering money for hygiene kits, and this past week, Ellie and I went shopping for the towels and washcloths. And for 100 kits, you can imagine, that really filled up the carriage. So we're at the register with this full carriage load, and two ladies separately approached us and said, what are you doing? <laughs> and so we explained about the um, mission project, and they each gave us $20. So we had an extra $40, so it was a joy. It brought tears to my eyes. Anyone else? Kim. I'd like to thank David for being in the choir. I know that Bill had mentioned it would be so nice if he could do that. <laughs> and you did it. It's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. It's a joy for me, too. I enjoy it. I love singing. I'd like to have prayers for um, someone of my acquaintance who is, I would say, suffering being in the dark night of the soul. And so just keeping with those people who are struggling with depression or anxiety. Yes, I have a, a, what I consider very special joy. A couple weeks ago, uh, I was sitting there wondering what I wanted to do with my day, and I realized I had a bunch of my father's stuff. My father was a World War II veteran, so I took it over to the Maine Military Museum. It's over in South Portland. For those of you who have seen it, it you know it's great. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I brought the stuff in, and while I was there, this elderly gentleman came in, and I was introduced to him. He was a World War II veteran who was 101 years old. 
and is still driving. <laughs> and, and while we were talking, two other elderly gentlemen came in that were in their 90s who were Vietnam veterans. So we got talking about Vietnam and some of the places we had been together. And during that conversation, one of them mentioned a gentleman that's a 60-year-old friend of mine who passed away recently. And another gentleman met another guy that was an old friend of mine who passed away about 10 years ago. So you know, it's just amazing. And I felt so much joy for three or four days that I only got not to meet those gentlemen, but to share my father's um, history with the museum and also to talk about old friends. Thank you for hearing that well. It's a great story. Anything else? All right. Well, let's be in the spirit of prayer. We come to you, O oh God, in the bleakness of our doubt. When questions arise, and we're sure where we're not sure where to find strength. We pray for your blessing in our boldness to dare to give voice to so many questions. We want to know so much, and it's hard to challenge the voices that deride, put down, and condemn our wondering. We listen for the wind to blow, to hear its sound howling through our souls with understanding and grace. God, we are newborns in our hope and confusion. Hear the deep yearnings of our heart. Open in us ways of genuine compassion. We live in a world of stark and confusing contrasts, beauty and ugliness, generosity and impoverishment, hope and despair, honesty and deception. We turn to you seeking in the stillness, the refuge and gift of silence, your presence, calm beckoning voice and renewing perspective. Guide us in our prayer, strengthen us in our action for this, our community, our nation, and our world. Loving God, we lift up the joys of our hearts this morning. We are so grateful for the strengthening and healing that it was experienced by Alex, the superhero, as he embarks on his first day of 11th grade. We lift him up as evidence of the strength and power of communal prayer. And we praise you for what you've done in his life and others. Similarly, we thank you for the strength and encouragement of Jolene, that she's doing so well, and thriving and finding ways to enjoy the things that she loves and things that she didn't love. Lord, help us to find new ways to find joy in our lives. I ask you to be with the one act participants. We lift up with joy, Sue's granddaughter, Abigail, and how she's able to portray anger in, in that situation. When I know from experience, Lord, she was experiencing joy of doing what she loves. We ask you to bless those that help and build and coordinate and deal with logistics for these events. Things like the One Act Festival and a worship service and a theatrical production, it all takes a lot of teamwork and help. And we thank you for each of the people who contribute in small ways and large. All right, thanks for the volunteerism and spirit of this congregation and the just assumed willingness to jump in and help. And uh, special thanks to Sid Pollard and others who have jumped in to help when weather throws obstacles in our way and we just toss them aside like snow. We ask your blessing on the hygiene kit ministry. We thank you that we were able to provide this for people, doing your work in this world, acting as your hands and feet. And we thank you that 
so many people out there who are yearning to find ways to contribute and yearning for ways to help that people were inspired to give monetarily and support this ministry. I just ask that you bless those gifts and others like them. We lift up the people serving in the military, in peacetime and in war. We thank you for the sacrifice that they make, for the lives that they give over to our country, to the service of our country. And thank you for those who who are in the veteran community and find opportunities to share their memories and find ways to connect with others and to demonstrate that indeed we are all connected in some way. And Lord, I ask you to share that connection, that connection of people to people with those who are going through the long dark night of the soul. Bring your comfort and sense of presence to Sally's acquaintance, but to all who struggle and suffer with depression and doubt and despair. Lord, all these things in the faith, hope, and love of Christ, we pray, along with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's Communion Sunday. Let us remain seated as we sing our communion hymn. Let us break bread together. Number 311.
This table is open to all who hunger and thirst for Jesus Christ. In company with believers in all times and all places. In this joyful feast of the people of God, we acknowledge Christ's presence among us with the promise of new life in his name. We come to know Christ in the breaking of bread and the pouring of the cup of salvation. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give thanks to you, O God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. O holy God, creator of all people and worlds, send now upon this bread and this cup your life-giving spirit. As we partake of this holy meal, fill us with the Holy Spirit, that we may be one body and one spirit in Christ. All glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'm my best here. On the night Jesus was betrayed, gathered with his friends, he took, his, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And giving it to his disciples, he said, take and eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. In like manner, he took the cup and blessed it and said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. The gifts of God for the people of God. Eat and drink to the covenant of the new birth. Please join me in prayer. We give you thanks, O God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our hymn of dedication is, How Can We Name a Love, number 409. So let us now collect our offering, rejoicing in the generosity of this congregation and the people of God. Thank you for your faithful contributions. May they be used to bless the community.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. We bring you gifts, O oh God, with all our questions. We know that you will work wonders with all we are to renew the beliefs with new wonders. Amen. Our hymn of dedication is number 409. How can we name a love? of night can feel endless and so lonely, but the wind blows and the spirit moves again. Know that the sun will not hurt you by day nor the moon by night, for God will protect you and watch over you this day and always. Amen. <laughs> 